Hi everyone, today I'm back with a yet, yet again, um, guess what, another video ripping apart this terrible garbage. It happened to Nancy by the late fraud Dr. Beatrice Sparks, who is not a doctor or a PhD at all. She didn't even have a single college degree or a clinical psychological practice, yet she like blew out all this garbage for decades and people believed she was only the editor or the discoverer or the, just the person who helped the young people keeping these alleged diaries now we know of course she was an absolute fraud if you guys have missed the prior videos in this series i've been doing recently um it happened to nancy was the first um dr fraud book which i ever read it was in autumn 1994 i read it um twice in a row i was 14 years old at the time my fresh woman year of high school i cried at the end both times and when i found out like 15 or so years later whenever as an adult that it was most probably and now I know 100% definitely made up and this poor girl like didn't exist she, this was not a sweet young innocent girl my age who had been taken advantage of like raped by someone she thought who she had been in love with and was left with AIDS and died within two years and I was just so angry I felt emotionally manipulated and I've been going through like point after point after point of everything that is wrong with this book you know the writing the situations the medical misinformation and now outdated information about AIDS just so many things and this particular video is going to post on uh, not going to not post on going to focus on why Nancy is a judgy McJudgerson this is not an exhaustive list I only put together um, nine quotes that really stood out for me stood out to me from the book I know I could definitely find a lot more if I you know, go back through it I do need to read back through it again because I'm putting together some more compilations of specific things in the book like mommykin's worship um very blatant um, Mormon references and like something else oh yeah that teen never said that that's going to be a fun video and blog post to do but anyway this is going to talk about nine specific like quotes or like sections and stuff I found which really like Nancy is totally like judging other people or situations with these like Victorian values and it's so obviously Dr. Fraud is you know channeling her own like Molly Mormon oh I'm so much better than those worldly people they're not good little Molly Mormons and Peter priesthoods like I am and like my husband and other people living in the Morador with us like they're just like evil and sinful and degraded because oh, they do things like premarital sex and abortion and they're gay and like they don't think there's anything wrong with that it's just like this woman was just like a complete a judgmental moralist and so let's just um start um going over the lines and i've you know put the you know the chapter in verse and so the pr preview the introductory paragraph this is from a blog post which will be going live presently Dr. Fraud well and truly not only wrote herself in as the all-conquering, all-knowing, wise, awesome Shiro in many of her books, she also used her characters as sounding boards to project her own holier-than-thou, archaic, judgmental, smug, Molly Mormon views. Had I known at 14 that It Happened to Nancy wasn't written by a fellow teen at all, but an old crank trying to scare us away from anything not a million percent G-rated. I would have been so offended and turned off. And, you know, the editors and agents putting these books together, they rightly said, okay, um, Mrs. Sparks, we understand like your feelings and such, but teens are generally like, scared away or feel like they're being lectured to or whatever by someone who like doesn't un really understand them when they see a grown-up's name on the cover, even as the editor or discoverer, because they relate to the book so much like better they feel oh this person who wrote the book was a real teen and really understands me because we were both you know in the same like experience level we're going through different the same things like for example we're in high school and you know first loves and adolescent feelings and all sorts of things like that but when they see a grown-up attached to that they might think oh I don't really want that and then this Rick Emerson in his wonderful book Unmask Alice which I am currently rereading he talks about the communications Mrs. Sparks had with Avon Books when they were putting together It Happened to Nancy for publication. And she's just deflecting it. Oh, uh, I don't care what you say. Screw you. I do what I want. When teens find an adult they trust, 
all caps, they trust completely. And it's hard to get teens away from me after a month in practice. And she was not happy how her name had to go on the back cover. And obviously, she eventually did get her way. Her name got onto the front cover on the reissue from 2005. <laughs> but anyway, let's just um keep going with this. Um, number 145. This is like just one separate video and post for this um, number on my like really long list that eventually goes to 200 of everything wrong with this book. And it's just such a big thing. I felt it merited its own like separate video and blog post. So Nancy is a judgmental, holier than thou, POS. Some prime examples. Like there's something that makes me uncomfortable with the kids, again, calling her own peers, the kids all the damn time, who can't use a sentence without half of it being filthy or sexy. What? I know lots and lots of kids at school and the mall are full of it, ellipsis, and they do it, ellipsis, and they have a right, but ellipsis, not us, page 87. One, what exactly does Dr. POS mean by filthy? And what exactly makes it filthy? To a Molly Mormon, that could mean anything that's not a Disney movie or like a Norman Rockwell painting. And why group filthy in with sexy? Like, what did the what did those things automatically have to do with one another? Did she did she mean sexual, or even understand? There's nothing inherently wrong with sexiness, like filthy and sexy. I well, I know she had this really like, anti-sex attitude, like abstinence only if you have sex one moment before that holy wedding band goes onto your finger when you're doing Pele ale in the temple, wearing like the baker's cap and the green fig leaf apron. Yes, that yes, that is really what Mormons wear when they're like getting married in their secret little cult ceremonies. If you oh if you have sex one moment before the Pele ale <laughs> ceremony. I know they don't say Pele ale anymore. Even they realize that was creepy and cult like, but it's still a really weird, goofy ceremony and chant they replaced it with. But, oh, terrible things will automatically happen to you if you have sex but one moment before you're legally husband and wife. And, oh, just look at these p girls in my books. Oh, they're pregnant and they gave the baby up because they were wise. Oh, and this one got AIDS and this one got a terrible STD and this one was left by her boyfriend. And it's implied anyone who has sex outside, outside of marriage is going to become a school whore. I'm going to get to that one later in this same video. So she just could not conceive of like anything sexual, particularly outside of marriage being like inherently positive or even like neutral at all. It was just, oh, bad, 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 sex, bad. I have a Mormon complex about sex and all things related to it. But, you know, anyway, I was that weird kid who never used the F word and was very turned off by how many of my peers swore fluently, as I put it, like from the seventh grade onwards. So I do know real teens can feel morally superior, particularly when they don't interact much with peers outside of school. I was that, you know, weird kid. I read like four or five grade levels up. I primarily had an intellectual life of the mind. So I basically wasn't really interacting with peers or going out socially or anything. That's a whole long story. I did touch on certain aspects of what it, why exactly that was in my fairly recent video about mental health may. But anyway, I just wasn't like Nancy at all. So I was basically like keeping to myself as often as possible. I had dinosaur tastes. I still do. I was mostly like reading and writing all the time, maybe watching TV every so often. But it's just like, but so I wasn't that kid who was you know, like showing off with cursing, but that's not the audience Dr. Fraud was trying to reach. She was trying to reach like more mainstream teens who actually had a life with, you know, friends and weren't like I was like sitting in my own little bubble all the time and not really like being, like, you know, socially aware, just like basically only seeing my peers at school and waiting for the bus stop and stuff like that. But as I was just saying, if you're trying to attract an audience of teens to your book, you don't insult them all offhandedly by calling them bad people for experimenting with strong language and curses to copy the cool kids or sound adult. I still don't use the F word to this day. I do not think that makes me morally superior. It's just like a habit I got into. I'm you know, afraid to use that word or even write it out longhand. But you know, that's my thing. I don't think you're a bad person if you use it yourself. It's just n not a habit I ever got into. And I just don't think after all these years I could ever like make myself speak or 
write that word longhand because like, you know, early on there's a window like, oh, if you're not doing something or it's not a habit by this point, I guess it never will. I never will be able to say the F word. So I know that makes me sound like a total out of touch prude. But, you know, unlike Dr. Fraud and Nancy, at least I no longer think, oh, that makes me so much better. It just means I I guess had a complex about swearing and never really got over that and started swearing like like almost everyone else in society. Here's another quote on page 116. I don't know how she could be so stupid, careless, childish, ellipsis, when finding out her friend Dory got knocked up and then Nancy said, oh, but I'm one, not really one to talk because I was stupid too for letting myself get raped along. Oh, this whole thing about blaming herself. Oh, I really led him on. It's like a gross oversimplification of how many, unfortunately, rape survivors do feel, oh, maybe I was to blame. It's my fault. And it's just like Dr. Fraud did not understand like that. What causes that whole attitude? It's just like a lazy trope. Oh, many survivors blame themselves. So better have Nancy do that big time. And of course, I'm amping up the Catholic guilt without even understanding what Catholic, Catholic guilt really is all about. Yes, because normal teens always think their friends are being childish for having sex and not always being so careful about birth control. Teen brains aren't adult brains. And yes, I think I did mention in a much prior video, I was so like annoyed these three girls in my Spanish class, my senior year of high school, one with, there was like a sophomore and two juniors. If I, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's who they were. They were constantly blabbing about their sex lives during class. And I was just so turned off. I didn't want to know that about them, particularly the sophomore she'd clearly been you know like like sexualized way too early since at least the age of 13 so obviously she had a lot of unhealthy sexual behavior unfortunately she passed in a car accident some years back but anyway that I didn't want to hear that and yeah I guess I did kind of have an attitude oh these girls are just like sluts and whores how can they have premarital sex it was a shock to me to discover just like I guess 19 years old when I started watching talk shows again wow I had no idea it's so common for unmarried people to be having sex and like they're not rushing to get married when they have kids and they're like living together and like just dating for five ten years why aren't they getting married or waiting to have sex so I eventually realized how out of touch my views where I still generally have those views but I no longer have the moral superiority with them I understand we you know don't live in a perfect world and it, it, most people in this you know day and age it's just not you know possible or just not something that you know believe in any way to you know like wait for marriage to have sex particularly because so many people now are no longer marrying at all of like you know 18 20 years old like they were in the old days and obviously that's a whole complicated subject for another thing here's another quote on page 129 I thought I was the only one who had it at first outside of the big cities where people have indiscriminate sex and use IVs and stuff one what teen uses the word indiscriminate? Yet another example of her characters constantly shooting off with like words they probably wouldn't even use for English class. Two, nice job stereotyping big cities as cesspits of sin and immorality. Three, this is such an obvious, the more you know, PSA disguised as a teen. Finding out AIDS can happen to anyone. Four, way to keep beating the anti-sex drum. This is from page 131. It was rude, crude, filthy, degrading, and disgusting. Referring to sex in an adult film, which she saw with her friend Elle a couple of years ago when they were like babysitting, I think. I'm anti-porn as well. That's obviously a whole thing for its other post. Um, like as a radical feminist, that's basically like one of the core like things of the, the second wave feminist movement being anti-pornography. Maybe I'll have a video about that if there's like ever any interest. But Nancy makes many other comments throwing shade on any kind of sex that's not lights out, under the covers, missionary, as vanilla as possible. So it's kind of like her disgust really isn't because it was an X-rated film. It, like X-rated these days just generally means like a really like artsy highbrow film. It's not no longer necessarily like sex film. That's more like XXX rated. And of course, there's no XX rated because who's going to say, oh, my movie isn't sexy enough, you know? But anyway, it's clear she's talking not about like porn, like inherently or, or almost always exploiting women and like trafficking and like assaults on camera and like spreading diseases and just generally like not respecting the performers and just like unhealthy, unrealistic portrayal of sex and like, you know, porn addiction is bad and stuff like that. No, she's 
referring to the, you know, oh, they're not, they're actually French kissing. Oh, that's so horrible. It's like animalistic and cannibalistic. Oh, gross. And oh, they're having sex. That's not nice Molly Mormon Peter Priest had making love because, you know, all teenagers think about like making love. Like, whoa, what is going on here? It's just this, she, this woman had such an unhealthy, like, you know, oh, anti-sex attitude. Sex is always bad, even within marriage. Like, gotta be abstinence only, even though we know, like, abstinence only education almost never really works. And here's another quote. Page 132. I guess I really did think that just drug users and bar-hopping gay guys on the streets of San Francisco got it. Yet another, the more you know, PSA. And again, with the offensive stereotyping on multiple levels, I'm sure the only reason Dr. Fraud didn't break out the homophobic slurs she sprinkled throughout Go Ask Alice and her uh, second book, um, Voices, which I have yet to locate a copy of, they're, they're, they are generally like fairly hard to find and the price is like way too expensive for what I would ever consider like, paying for her absolute garbage and that book is like even worse than her usual because it's not in diary form they're like four long monologues pretended interviews with teen runaways but so anyway I'm sure the only reason she didn't like break out all those same homophobic slurs in those two books was because even she had enough presence of mind to understand those attitudes those attitudes weren't so socially acceptable anymore by the early 90s and even back when Voices was published in like a late um 78, I believe it or not, the New York Times press, like people were saying, wow, this homophobic and lesbophobic sentiment in here, that's like really tone deaf and it's insulting. So even people in the late 70s were starting to realize like homophobia is bad. This is really like out of touch. Like what is this woman like living in 1930 or something like that? Here's another quote, page 159. This is a nice, clean little town ellipsis but is it possible that some of our kids have it again with the kids and won't know for years and years and years she loved and loved and loved repeating 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 a word 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 thrice 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 for emphasis 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 she did this from the days of go ask gallus i hate the word clean in reference to people and sexual things since the opposite is dirty, it implies only certain kinds of people and sex are acceptable. And I particularly hate the term clean romance. I far prefer like sweet romance. There's, you know, nothing wrong at all with having like a romance or even like a romance subplot in a book that's not only about the romance, whereas there's no like, sex scenes. Like not all of my couples in my own books like have sex scenes on the pages. Many of them do, but like not all of them. Do so, you know, I don't think you have to have like sex scenes in a romance, but just to say, oh, no sex scenes at all, it's clean. That's that's really offensive. It's like saying, so those of those of us who choose to do sex scenes when we feel, you know, the story and character development merits it, so we're somehow like dirty or our characters are dirty or our books are dirty or like people in general who have sex that's not like the way you believe in it is like they're dirty too that's just really really offensive I just hate the word clean and I would never you know query back in the day when I was querying like oh we like clean reads like bye I'm not into people who have that kind of like attitude of moral judgmentalism also Real life isn't a damn Norman Rockwell painting or Andy Hardy movie. I hate Mickey Rooney so much, but that series in particular is just so freaking unrealistic. Most people don't marry their first and only partner at all of 18. Wait for marriage to have sex or live G-rated Molly Mormon and Peter Priesthood lives. Sorry, not sorry. That's just, you know, not how society is anymore. Here's a quote from page 89. What if after, um, let's see, asterisks, ampersand plus sign like what is it equal sign minus sign or is that an underscore and that's only five characters not six to represent in Colin's name because it's with two l's I had it met Lou and I'd become just another one of the school whores passing it around like M&M's oh judgmental judgy McJudgerson why go to so much effort to use a string of symbols in place of a name you refuse to write. What? 
just use an insulting nickname, like, you know, whatever, whatever you can think of, or to the point term, like that jerk. Also, nice slut shaming. Girls who've been sexually abused and or sexualized very young, sadly, do often tend to engage in self-destructive, unhealthy sexual behavior like that girl in my Spanish class I just mentioned. But they don't start that path down, don't they don't start down that path all by themselves. Like, oh, just that, I, I, I'm lost for words with that one quote in particular. Oh, a school whore. Other girls are whores just because they have sex. And any girl who's having sex is automatically a whore. And they must be passing around STDs because, you know, condoms don't really work as illustrated by her friends or acquaintances, Kelly and Belinda, getting knocked up despite using condoms and then Dory says, oh, Fred doesn't use condoms all the time. That's why I got knocked up. Oh, six dollars for a dozen rubbers. Oh, that's so expensive. Uh, she had this, and it continues in the back matter. Oh, you can't really trust condoms. Or, uh, who trusts condoms? Even doctors think they're unreliable. It's just this, this whole, like, abstinence-only anti-sex crusade. It's just so, so freaking offensive. And here's another one. I think this is the penultimate from... 195. I've never given a thought to new kids before. This is when she's um, staying by her dad in Arizona. I grew up with most of the gaggle, oh, I hate that dumb term for her friends, since kindergarten. Most of the other kids too, and I've always belonged. I didn't realize how much being an outsider can hurt, how humiliating and ego-battering it is, and she's also had a number of prior and um, succeeding passages about, oh, no one's really paying attention to me because I'm the new kid. Like, why aren't they, like, rolling out the red carpet and pile-driving their heads up my ass like everyone else back home in South Carolina does? And this also, I, I address this more in a coming um, video and blog post. So did the gaggle go to kindergarten with her? Like, if, uh, so are they all Catholic? Because Nancy went to Catholic school, at least. Um, her friend Red obviously isn't Catholic because her uncle has this surprise fire and brimstone Protestant evangelical type of sermon at a summer holiday cabin. So that's really a contradiction. But again, Dr. Fraud could not keep any of her stories straight, either her real life stories about herself or the crap she spun out in all of these books. So anyway, kind of gives her a taste of her own exclusionary medicine. Barely anyone acknowledged my existence more than perfunctorily for the longest time at my second high school, which I attended for my junior year only, since they had been with these other people since kindergarten and rarely got new kids. And I was just a liberal, anky, liberal Yankee outcast outsider, kind of like reminding them, oh, the entire world isn't like this but instead of feeling oh maybe like it's with them oh it must be with me because I'm the one who's refusing to do the creepy daily loyalty oath to the flag sorry not sorry oh I must be a communist because I don't believe in that cult ritual and oh I'm not doing things exactly like everyone else and oh no I'm giving another like speech or research paper on like Russian history and culture oh that's so boring and stupid I'm too intellectual I'm in just an idiot oh and you're like butting against the town's established culture what a horrible person you must be like barely like anyone like acknowledged me or wanted to even make friends with me and so anyway like it kind of serves people I mean I was always like welcoming and nice to people but Nancy obviously wasn't and it kind of like serves them right oh but I was popular before, but I should always be popular. Like, put yourself in the shoes of those of us who have to go to new schools instead of thinking, oh, everyone must be popular and they must accept me because I was popular too. And like, that's just how everyone is. They're supposed to always be nicey nice to one another. Yeah, maybe this will open like someone's eyes to, oh yeah, maybe I should be nice to new kids because they don't have a million built in BFFs and maybe they'll have to eat lunch in the bathroom all year or almost all year because like no one wants to sit with them at lunch and they're kicked out of tables because oh the football star is coming and oh you can't sit here we don't know you you have to sit somewhere else like screw you you're on your own dumb new kid I just that attitude it just like really brought back my own experience and here is I think no this isn't the pundum ultimate there there are at least two more this is from page 200 um 54. This is when she's talking to Dr. Fraud out in Idaho. I told her about my junior high and how filthy a lot of the kids talked and how immoral a lot of them were. Ellipsis. But I didn't tell her about Dory. She's different. She just got carried away and let hormones take over her brain. 
Oh, yes, you and Dory are so different and special than those icky people who live in the real world. Instead of using outdated slang like, cheese Louise, only doing five-second closed-mouth kissing, taking purity pledges, and being scared straight by having sex with the wrong guy. Oh, I just hate this woman so much. And yeah, here's the last one, page 95. She, Aunt Thelma, was the one who taught me that people who use crude and vulgar words only do it because they don't have the vocabulary or the desire to describe things as they truly are. Ugh, what a judgmental freak. Aunt Thelma is an odious control freak, hardly a paragon of moral virtues. And again, how exactly are you defining crude and vulgar? Anything stronger than, oh, sugar, oh, my heck, and darn. Dr. Fraud was the kind of person who immediately quits reading a book upon encountering a sex scene, no matter how well written and important to the plot and character development. Just the, and those are just the nine quotes that stood out to me the most during my fourth reading of this um, book. Uh, there were just so many more like sprinkled throughout it. It's just a judgy McJudgerson. Oh, I am so glad this woman was exposed as a fraud and her a lot of her books seem to be like going out of print or just harder and harder to find for good reason and now at goodreads and amazon on many of them she is listed as the actual author it's no longer anonymous or anonymous teen or unknown or whatever the whole world knows that knows this woman was an absolute fraud just horrible horrible and look forward to a whole bunch more videos in this series and thank you you guys very much for watching and please leave a comment letting me know your own experience with this fraud in general or liter this fraud in particular or literary frauds in general have you read the book um unmask alice or any of her other books and so um thank you guys very much for watching i'll see you soon bye